Sheryl Sandberg said that careers are like a jungle gym, not a ladder. A place that inspires imagination, there, where you won't get bored and it's easier to assemble than you might think. As Tim has just said, I attended the Young Researchers Conference, the very first Young Researchers Conference that the institution put on 20 years ago today. And I was sitting like you are, with a slight anticipation about what the rest of my life would involve in this audience. I remember thinking it was a little daunting, as I'm sure you do now. I was asked to come here today with, a, with the brief of talking around an exciting construction project and about my career. And although my talk will look at these things, I really wanted to share with you some philosophies or ideas that have helped me guide myself in my career decision making. And I'm hoping that they'll also give you some sort of insight for what you might do and how you might make some of the decisions as you go forth in your careers. The five principles I use are encapsulated in quotes. Eleanor Roosevelt's life is what you make it. Again, from Eleanor Roosevelt, do something every day that scares you. Teddy Roosevelt, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing you can do is the wrong thing. The worst thing you can do is do nothing. Jorgen Wittgenstock from Lego, blame is not for failure, it is for failing to help or to ask for help. And Moliere, it is not only for what we do that we are held responsible, but also for what we do not do. So with these five things in mind, let me tell you how I've taken these and used them whilst on my journey from 20 years ago to today. Some 20 years ago, as I said, I, I was a, a young researcher from Trinity College in Dublin. I'd come over here on a day trip to London, and I was halfway through my PhD called Sleeved Concrete Cylinders, Subject to Hard Impact. I had to, to look up the exact uh, title, because in the midst of time, you forget these things. I was really enjoying the experience of research and getting to study, as Tim said, a problem that I had set for myself in great depth, making sure that I'd covered all the aspects associated with theory and practice, and I contributed as best I could to the, the, to the wide body of knowledge of material science. The smashing of concrete cylinders confined by steel or, concrete, or, steel or aluminium or plastic was incredibly satisfying. Um, and it probably did contribute in a small way to our understanding of material science. But as I came towards the end of my research, I realized I had done it in a vacuum without any input from industry. And that perhaps at the end of that, I realized it might have actually been more valuable if I'd actually worked out a more practical application rather than just a theoretical study. Although fascinated by teaching and the idea of, of, of pursuing research, as Tim said, I knew I completed my, when I completed my PhD, I knew that that was something I had, had done. But I wanted to try my hand at building design and to find myself a role as a structural engineering graduate in a consulting practice. I was fairly safe in the knowledge that when they're looking for academic lecturers, they're always welcoming ones who actually have some industry experience. So I had that as a reassurance. I started in Bureau Happold 17 years ago as a graduate in 2001, wowed by the work of a company that had just finished the Millennium Dome, the Al Faisal Leah Tower in Riyadh, the Globe Theater, um, the Japan Pavilion at the Hanover Expo, the Great Court of the British Museum. The company had a young, dynamic workforce and although it only had a 1,000 staff at the time, it seemed to really care about the careers of each one, and it punched above its weight in terms of the amazing projects that it was involved in. I left Dublin and indeed home for the first time. In Ireland, there's not the same culture of moving to go to university as you have here in the UK. And I moved to Bath. I really struggled for the first few months, if I'm honest. I had a good degree and indeed a PhD, but in retrospect, it was very theoretical. I knew about how to calculate a bending moment or a shear force, 
but I didn't know that they were tabulated. Um, and, but however, I was able to put the ideas, that thought process that comes at research into practice almost immediately, developing quick ways to, to create spreadsheets to calculate bending moment capacities of beams. Having recently completed research, I was really keen to get stuck into design work, but this is not a quick stage of learning. Although we want to be able to do the things that people we can see around us are doing, we need to actually take time and move through these career, um, career stages quite carefully. I often make an analogy when I'm talking to younger engineers about the fact it's like creating a, a brick wall. You've got to make sure that each brick is lined and leveled and put in the right place before you put the adjacent brick you know, beside it or then the next course above it. If you fail to put bricks in the right place, it's going to make that wall less stable for the future. And I caution you not to rush through these early stages because they really are the foundation for where you'll go in the future. So that's what I did. My first project was the design of a fence, admittedly a very posh fence with glue lamp tusks and stainless steel mesh and a whole lot of piles. Um, I then designed a timber grid shell for the roof uh, of a Sikh temple. I then spent six months on site at the University of Cambridge building their Centre for Mathematical Sciences. I designed schools, office blocks and hospitals. And at the end of three years I was rewarded by becoming a chartered member of the ICE and then the ISTRUCT. I then used some of the theories of my PhD, although not as many as one might like, um, to study dynamics. And I became one of the company's first experts in dynamics, particularly footfall uh, on suspended floors. Then I worked on uh, ground-borne dynamics, dealing with the design of a laboratory, um, which had to be, it had a laser in it. And the laser had to hit the equivalent of a 10p piece at a distance of 10 kilometers. And it had to be held steady for the duration of an hour. So that was literally using every single bit of practical engineering that I and my colleagues around me had designed, but also huge amounts of my understanding of, of research and, on, on, and of theory. I had to look at all the complicated mathematical formula that I'd learned as a student and apply them to a real life problem. I then also did a whole pile of other consulting within the company on dynamics in terms of designing staircases and car parks and theatres and that sort of stuff. I then joined our sports team designing part of the Aviva Stadium in Dublin and I was responsible for the design of the, the structural design anyway of the pit and paddock building uh, at Silverstone, now called the Silverstone Wing. Um, and then again back to a bit more theory, I was uh, designing this complex waveform for a bus station in Slough. The opportunities, if you take it life and you, you make it your own, kept unfolding. It's really important to remember that. And I started work on a mixed-use commercial development in Qatar. Eleanor Roosevelt says, do one thing every day that scares you. I certainly did that when, after 11 years in our bath office, I relocated from my, with my family from beautiful, quiet, peaceful suburban uh, Bath uh, to Qatar in the spring of 2012 because I was going to lead on site the work that I just spent the last two and a half years designing. Bureau Happel was responsible for designing the, uh, the engineering for 25 buildings in phases two and three of the Musharraf downtown Doha project in the center of the Qatari capital. This is the area of the site, but it's very difficult if you don't know Doha to, to get some sort of context. It sits, right, uh, it sits quite close to the Emiri Diwan, the seat of power in, in Doha, and beside the, the uh, cultural and shopping, shopping uh, heart, which is the Souk Waqif. Fundamentally, and Tim will be able to relate to this, this is the equivalent size of the site that we were responsible for in Bath. Bath is a, is a Roman town in the west of England, and it effectively takes, the site that we were developing takes the entirety of the city centre. 
Um, we were developing a mixed-use uh, mixed series of buildings, offices, residential, uh, um, mosques, uh, and a shopping centre. 100 buildings were being constructed on this site by up to six main contractors simultaneously. It aimed to redefine Qatari architecture, blending the best of traditional with modern technologies in order to create a new and innovative architectural language. This was all being planned in the centre, as I said, of historic Qatar. Um, and there were four historic, about 50 years old, buildings on the site that they wished to convert into museums after they'd installed a three-storey basement underneath them. The project aims to regenerate much of the city centre in a sustainable way for the 21st century, removing the urban sprawl. This was the site before construction began, just, the, just as uh, demolition had started to take place on the far end, um, and make it into a new and dynamic landmark for the 21st century. Excavation and piling works were underway as I arrived. So what's it like to be on a construction site where 100 buildings are being built simultaneously? After 11 years in the office, I had matured as a design engineer, but leading Middle East site-based work is a very different challenge, and not just from the technical aspects of it. The construction managers were outwardly accepting, uh, but clearly, despite having female colleagues, were senior women just weren't usual. After an overly polite start, their concerns began to realize, to be, begin to, to reduce as they realized that Dr. Sarah was able to deal capably with contractors, technical matters, and shifting site politics with a cheerful attitude that they were rarely able to mimic. Office meetings with a male to female ratio of 20 to 1 became the norm, and the accepted norm and increasingly their concerns dwindled as they realized that I was able to make my point of view known without shouting, screaming, or thumping the table. It wasn't, however, as if they didn't shout at me. Uh, after one particularly tempestuous meeting, one of, my, uh, one of the, the contractors came up to me and apologized profusely, saying that he had, he had never shouted at a woman before. And I realized that I was having some success. They saw me as an engineer first and a woman second. I accepted his apology graciously. Um, uh, fine, sorry. Um, so these are some of the site, uh, the site photographs. I'm going to take you through a few more of these. You can see the scale of what's going on. This is the whole. Uh, the, 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 first state, the first buildings are being constructed on the first phase, but all of the rest of the excavation works are the bits that we were responsible for as Bureau Happold. Teddy Roosevelt said, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing you can do is the wrong thing. The worst thing you can do is nothing. This was not a time in my career, but then nor has any bit been since, where you could do nothing. So with a huge sight moving forward, I learned how to make decisions consider decisions quickly but decisively, and then to live with the consequences. This is one of the great stages that you need to go through as you mature as either a consultant or as a design engineer, or, or, or as a research engineer. You need to be able to have courage in your convictions and realize that you have to move forward with them because often there's lots of people who need to know where they're going to go. As I said, construction was underway at a large scale. They'd excavated over 5 million cubic meters of soil and rock. They installed 7,000 piles and then put down 450,000 square meters of waterproofing. There were over 1.3 million cubic meters of concrete poured on the project from two on-site batching plants and another four batching plants around Doha. The largest pour we did was just over 7,200 cubic meters. It took 45 hours. And one contractor managed to place 30,000 cubic meters in a month. 
There were multiple work fronts all happening simultaneously on this huge site. Eleven tower cranes operated simultaneously on each of the six phases. And in each 24-hour shift, over 5,000 men worked on a, in a 24-hour cycle. So on each of the shifts, there were often tens of thousands of people working on the project of any one time. I, of course, was working with a, an excellent, if very international, team of engineers who brought very different experiences to bear on helping us construct this project that wasn't only structural engineering, but we were also responsible for all the building services engineering, all the acoustics, all the fire, all the facades work. And we made those drawings and those specifications a reality. Things were equally challenging out on site. The staff always addressed me as sir, the default for somebody in charge. Um, and the contractors team quickly understood that I was consci as conscientious and knowledgeable as any male colleague and, or, or, as, or as any other consultant they'd encountered. I was the experienced person that my colleagues referred to when they had problems. And I was happy to crawl into any reinforcement cage if needed in order to make sure problems were quickly resolved. Successive challenges arrived throughout my time there, but I was amply compensated by delivering what became, what's becoming an iconic group of buildings. It's very satisfying to, make, to, to be part of delivering something that's absolutely unique, to step out of your comfort zone and to overcome a series of obstacles and to realize that you can create something that will become a landmark for the future. Whilst we were there, the artist Richard Serra installed this installation in the desert, close to where we, where we used to go camping uh, at the weekends in winter. It's called East West West East, and it's supposed to represent different cultures and the gaps between them and the challenges of overcoming those different viewpoints. It reminds me that everybody should be equally encouraged to explore new challenges and hope the experience gained will provide them with fresh insights and ways of tackling new problems that they might never have considered if they hadn't grasped the opportunity, done something that scared them, and learned to make and live with decisions and the consequences of them. Jürgen fix Kurtstop said the blame is not for failure, it's for failing to help or to ask for help. Throughout the time that I was in the Middle East building the Musharraf Downtown Doha project, my colleagues were involved in ongoing design in the UK. We had helped deliver the London 2012 Olympic Stadium, um, the Emirates Airline, and other colleagues have been involved in the design of the Memorial, Memorial Pavilion uh, for the 9-11 uh, buildings, to name just a few. A year after I returned to the UK to, to look after the Bath Structures team, my career took another turn and I was asked to become the UK Engineering Director for a business unit that had just been amalgamated from three different business units previously in the UK. I was all of a sudden responsible for the largest group of employees within our entire global company. I'm not sure that my previous roles, either as a design engineer or indeed my time in Qatar, had quite set me up for this level of responsibility uh, or, or this different sort of working. There was certainly a lot less shouting um, and there were a lot more supportive architects around when you're working in the UK. But I had an incredible opportunity to support the development of the company and of the people within it helping them develop their careers and moving the company from good to great. In order to achieve this, you need to um, follow clear processes in a really meticulous way, going back to that, that rigor of research with a clear sight of the end goal so that we can cre create unique, beautiful projects that we can be proud of. We also need to be very aware that consultancy is not just a process or a methodology. 
It's an attitude or mindset that puts clients at the heart of everything we do. Leadership is a very fundamental part of this and supporting people as they learn and develop. In my work, I can't be expected to know everything, nor can I expect the people around me to know everything. But we need to be able to ask and to understand, to be allowed to make mistakes, to ask for help and then to receive us, to allow us to grow and create strong, supportive learning communities. Moliere said, it is not only for what we do that we will be held responsible, but also for what we do not do. Engineers have a really important impact on society and on the world in which we all inhabit it, both now and in the future. With this impact, we guide the design of buildings, structures, cities, and it, it seems great, but it comes at great responsibility, and we have to use that responsibility with care. We must make sure in the decisions we make that they will result in sustainable futures, that real principle of doing no harm. However, it's not only for the doing we're held responsible, but also for the not doing. We have a professional responsibility as engineers to make sure that we're designing safe, sustainable buildings, which will enhance the built environment and also make better the workplaces and the lives of the people who occupy them. We have to, stay, to step up and take action in many different areas to challenge perceptions and to make the future a better place. This is a particular focus for my colleagues and I in Bureau Happold as we lead the design of cities, buildings, and infrastructures for the future. I think it was Einstein, but you can challenge me on this, who said, what got us here today is unlikely to keep us there or get us to where we need to be in the future. In Bureau Happold, we're striving to develop a business that's focusing on providing transformational outcomes that challenge conventional wisdom for each of our clients and on each of our projects. We're working now in a time that's ever changing. There are growing urban centers and those urban centers are far from where we are today. Planning, design and construction of buildings needs to lead to higher effectiveness. Digital technology, as we'll talk, I'll talk about in a minute, is now ever present and inclusive and our clients are constantly looking for new sources of values. We want to work with more enlightened clients and in markets and sectors we are experts in. We want to analyze what the clients need and what their priorities are. We want to harvest and analyze relevant data and seek new insights based on that data to, uh, to work out how to meet clients' needs and link our actual engineering to client outcomes and through that to propose engineering consultancies and services. Our intention is to use a greater degree of knowledge gained from data that we've analyzed to provide insight into how things can be designed for optimum outcomes. Effectively through this, through this analysis of data, replacing what we use of inherited wisdoms. Thus, we need to identify, define, and deliver future outcomes today, giving us greater certainty and reduce the risk to clients in, uh, and the world starting now. I've got two examples of how we're starting to do this. In our sports sector, we're beginning to design stadia to ensure there's an incredible atmosphere, a real feeling of excitement for people who are running around on the pitch, that their team are supporting them and spurring them on to win. That can be achieved by designing stadia bowls in, 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 in innovative ways. Stadium atmosphere sounds so exciting, but this data-driven philosophy also relates to optimizing design of buildings and, and, and indeed office blocks in this case so that the outcomes we get are, are far superior in terms of work-life balance than we would otherwise do 
if we designed it in a more conventional manner. Our engineers are using virtual and augmented reality to understand those future outcomes. We've been considering uh, uh, city design for connected and autonomous vehicles, thinking about what space utilization will be like, what infrastructure would be needed in order to make this effective and possible, and, and how cities will operate when mobility is a service that we all just use as needed. We're using parametric design, as I said, to design, design stadias, um, to use, to use the, the minimum amount of resource so that we tread the earth lightly. And we also help clients understand what their buildings will be like before they move into it, so they can get off to the best start uh, in, in knowing how this will happen. We're trying to, and we have a responsibility, to use augmented reality to facilitate our work in inclusive design. In the UK, we've made such strides recently on making um, buildings accessible. But have we really thought about whether they're designed inclusively so that everybody can use them with the same degree of ease? I tried our new augmented reality system um, for the Stratford waterfront redevelopment on the former Olympic site that we're working on last week. Effectively, it simulates what it's like to be in a wheelchair moving around the outsides of the buildings and, 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 and going up to the entrances. Of course, the buildings are accessible, there's a ramp. But through this, and the fact that you've actually got a, a, a controller in each hand, and you've got to be moving the wheels of the wheelchair to push yourself up those ramps, you understand the challenges of still getting to the front door. Now, I had to stop that quite quickly because it was my first time using augmented reality and I had no idea how sick I would feel within a couple of minutes. But I can tell you that even in that two-minute experience, the ex you know, pushing myself in a wheelchair up that hill was hard work. And it makes us think about making buildings more inclusive. We're also doing some similar work for dealing with buildings um, inside and out when you've got visual impairments. Again, making design as inclusive as possible through 21st, uh, 21st century design and research techniques. Of course, as responsible engineers, we also need to make things beautiful, to uplift the human spirit, to give people great and inspirational places to live and work. It's a real challenge at a time of increasing automation, where we can design from a computer and build in a factory. But we do need to continue to focus on craft and individuality in design in order to make things beautiful. We've got to remember that we can use the cleverest automation, automation and optimization techniques, but still create something absolutely beautiful, just as they did at the time of the arts and crafts movement. This on the right is a tiny element of a hotel building in Macau. Each node on the exoskeleton is different to every other. We used a lot of clever analysis and scripting to get the design of this optimized. But we also worked with the architect to make sure that it was beautifully crafted and something that's very elegant for the future. While sustainability is about the planet, it's also about people. For an organization to be sustainable, it needs to be profitable. Whilst many organizations are creating buildings that are kind to the planet, true innovation probably comes from making workers who are in these buildings feel great and get the job done more effectively and to a higher standard. Ultimately, this is also good for business because more productive workers um, have a significant impact on the company's bottom line. Engineers such as myself and my colleagues have a great responsibility to work through the design stages in order to create great buildings, but to help also health, well-being and productivity. 
We can integrate plants and greenery. Studies have shown that just by uh, having um, green plants in buildings, you can increase productivity by 12%. We can make sure the temperature control is comfortable and that the air is fresh. If you double the amount of outdoor air in an office building, you can potentially reduce short-term sickness by 35%. We can show people daylight. It has a significant impact on circadian rhythms, seeing daylight during the day. Office workers who get more daylight sleep better at night and are therefore more productive the next day. We need to get the acoustics right. We need to be able to provide spaces for people to be quiet and to think, but also where they, can, uh, uh, where they can have group conversations and brainstorm ideas. It has a 25% impact, potentially, on productivity, the, 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 the acoustic aspects. Getting office layouts right, not only thinking about the accessibility uh, and the inclusiveness for everybody, but making it legible as a space to go and, and, and work in and, and navigate through helps us to be happier there. We need to think again about inclusive design and potentially helping people to be fitter and more healthy. But we know too often staircases, unlike in this building, are tucked away and we don't therefore use them, we jump into the lift. But actually making the staircase the office gym reduces cardiovascular disease um, by, between, uh, by up to 20%. And we also need to make the most of views. Again, part of that daylight aspect, but not only coming from above, actually seeing out to the landscape or even to the buildings around you helps people understand uh, what's going on, gives them context, and makes them more productive in work. These are all so simple, they're almost obvious, yet engineers can really contribute to making a difference for workers, in this case, um, which can offer important wins to business by enhancing productivity. This is the sort of engineering we want to be known for, for making things better and not just turning the other way. As you step away today, you'll be continuing to progress on your own career journey. And I'm sure there will be many other twists and turns on the way. A lot of the decisions can seem very daunting, but you will have incredible opportunities, either as an engineer or as a researcher, in shaping our planet and making it better for the future. It's probably worth thinking about the principles that you'll use to guide you, as they're unique for everybody. Fundamentally, we're all actually trying to achieve slightly different things as we balance our works and our lives. But I'm hoping you might have gained some inspiration from understanding what some of mine are. As a parting one, I probably think of a sixth, this time from Helen Keller. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. We're so lucky as engineers to work as part of teams. Yes, that often means that we get less individual recognition. And if that's what you're seeking, you may be in for a disappointment. But through teamwork, we bring the ideas of many together to make a unique, beautiful, and hopefully sustainable whole. Long may it continue. Thank you.